Hi, I'm Alex Satmarie. I'm a mechanical engineer at Hexagon, and I help students and professors put our software to work. In this video, I'm going to show you how the Education Beam tool in MSC Apex works. This video has three big parts. First, we're going to look at one of the models generated by the tool and see what are the different components of it. In the second part of the video, we're going to look at how would you make one of these models from scratch. And in part three, we're going to talk about how you could modify it, and I'll show you how. Um, parts two and three are uh, a little advanced, but I think that part one is definitely worth your time. All right, let's get into it. Okay, I'm going to build a simply supported beam in Apex. So I click Education, Beam. I'll set a right-hand side location of 2, a force of 2E3. Uh, I'll keep my force location at 1, and we'll do pin and roller supports so that it's a simply supported beam. I'll hit the green check mark to apply. Let's inspect this model. We're going to go to the Model tab, and I can click Expand All Containers to reveal all the parts of this model. I'm going to conceal instrumentation. I'm going to take you through the beam, the force applied to the beam, and the constraints. So the beam is thought of by Apex is actually a few different things put together. One is it's a geometry. Um, it's a curve. It has X and Y and Z coordinates for its left and right hand sides. And if we were dealing with a more complex part, well, there would be a lot more to the geometry. But a beam is about as simple as it gets, at least if it's what we call a 1D beam. It's a 1D beam because we're representing the spans in it by telling Apex, here's what the moments of inertia would be anywhere along the beam. Um, so Apex is thinking about the X direction of the beam really differently from the Y and Z. And we can set the Y and Z cross section information about the beam as a span. You can inspect that here, which gets you basically the same kind of stuff that you could get from looking at the beams tool. So this gives us the length of the beam, the curve does, the span gives us the cross section of the beam. And then there's one more thing to how Apex thinks about the beam itself, and it's the mesh. So we're doing finite element analysis. This is a finite element model. What that means is that we've taken something continuous, a beam, and we've cut it into a hundred finite elements. Apex is solving for the displacement at each of the nodes along the length of this beam, and the nodes are at the ends of the elements. The nodes connect the elements, and those are the little dots that you see here. So where you see a little like rectangle, that's an element, and where you see a dot, that's a node. We could have had more elements or fewer elements if we were to change the mesh size. So we could go from a mesh size of 0.02 to 0.2, and now you see, once I hit apply, that the elements are now much more coarse. I'm going to change this back. Now let's look at force. So I can highlight force here, and you see the force highlighted in my viewport. So that's where the force is at the midpoint of the beam. I can double click on the force, and we can inspect it. There's actually a lot to applying forces in finite element models, but if you want to apply a force to a single node, it's pretty simple. You can set a scale factor of 1, and then you can set x, y, and z components of the force. So if you wanted to go apply forces to your own models, that's how you could do it. Now let's look at constraints. And actually, before I open up the constraints, I want to pull up the slides that I showed you previously about different types of beams. So this is a simply supported beam. It has a pin at the left-hand side and a roller on the right-hand side. In solid mechanics, we take that as meaning that we have a reaction for the pin in the x and y directions and a reaction uh, simply in the y direction for the roller. We need to represent things a little bit differently in Apex because in Apex, everything is always 3D, but in solid mechanics, when we're analyzing beams, we're often doing the statics only in 2D for simplicity. And that works perfectly fine. That leads to things just being a little bit more complicated than you might have seen in the textbook. But you can manage. So let's go look at the constraints in Apex. First, let's look at the left-hand side. That's the pinned constraint. I select it, double-click it, and you see it highlighted there. It was highlighted in purple. Great. The important thing to see is what are the constrained degrees of freedom. 
So we have translation in x, y, and z all constrained, along with rotation about the x-axis. What I just showed you on the slide, that's why we have translation in x and y being constrained. Translation in z is necessary because we're dealing with a 3D model. We don't want the beam also being able to walk into or out of the screen. And you might think, is that really necessary? We don't have any forces being applied in the Z direction. It's necessary more for numerical reasons than for engineering reasons. We also constrain rotation about the X axis. That means that this beam can't spin like an axle, which if you think about it, the way that we had this constraint, we didn't say that that couldn't happen. And we have to prevent that from happening for the model to be able to run properly. Now we can look at the right hand side of the beam. So I'm just gonna double click that and you'll see that the only difference is that translation in the X direction is turned off. Uh, this just lets us match well with the pin and roller supports that we normally use in solid mechanics when we're studying simply supported beams. One more thing that we see in the model browser is instrumentation. And we can see what that looks like by enabling this viewer here. This just shows that Apex is able to detect what are the forces and moments at many positions along the beam and calculate those so that we can see a shear and bending moment diagram. Being able to do that is maybe not super impressive for a beam, but Apex is also very good at doing that on things that are irregularly shaped like airplane wings, and that's really useful. I've shown you what are all the parts of the model. I'm next going to show you how you would make it from scratch. So I'm going to delete the geometry the constraints, the loads, the instrumentation. Just delete, delete, delete. What I am keeping is the definition of the beam span in here. So we've got that beam shape and the material properties that we've been using. First, I'm going to generate the beam curve. So I can go into Geometry Create Tools and go to Polyline. Apex has some geometry creation tools. They're pretty simple. Um, you wouldn't want to use this to design a part from scratch, but this can be really great if you need to modify a geometry on the fly. Um, and what I'm checking for right now is just that I've got things lined up to be able to make a two meter long beam. You can set a grid spacing here. Uh, I set it to 0.1 meters and that's going to make it easy for me to click at the coordinates that I want to click at. So I've clicked at the left hand side of the beam and now I want to run out to not the very end of the beam but where I'm applying the force which is one meter out. And then from here the right hand side of the beam is going to be another one meter out. Great, so now I've got a beam and I was careful to allow a vertex to be created right at that point for us to apply a force. So I'll exit this. Well, I said force, let's go apply a force. So I went to loads and boundary condition tools and clicked force. We have a scale factor of one and the force of minus 2000 newtons is already here. So I just need to click on this point. To be able to click a single vertex like that, it really helps to have vertices selected in this picker here. So I'll close this. Now let's apply the constraints. So I click constraint. We want to use a general constraint type. The other ones here are basically just special cases of this general constraint. Um, so anything that you want to do, you can do with the general constraint. Let's constrain translation in X, Y, and Z directions so that we get a nice pinned constraint at this point here. And let's constrain only Y and Z on the right hand side. And I've made a mistake on purpose that is going to be revealed to us in a couple minutes so that you see how to troubleshoot it. So we've got the beam, it's got forces and constraints applied to it. Let's apply a span to it. So I'll hit beams and then create beam span. And now we just need to click on the beam. And Apex has now given a cross section to the beam, which we can see here. We'll now mesh the beam. So I'll click on mesh, curve mesh, 
and I'll use a mesh of 0.02. And I'll click on the right hand side and left hand side of the beam. And now the beam is made of 100 pieces, 100 finite elements. I think the last thing for us to do is to add instrumentation. So I click on Sensors and Instrumentation Tools, X Section Force Sensor, X Section Sensor Array, and I've selected 101 sensors. Now I click on the beam, and then I have to do uh, a couple of other things, and I can recall what they are by clicking on the workflow instructions here. So I'll need to click the middle mouse button. I could set these sensors in a way that's more complex than this, but the default is just fine. I'm going to click MMB again, middle mouse button, and that completes the creation. So I see all of my sensors are here. They kind of clutter the display, so I'm actually going to hide them now. Now let's create a simulation. I'm going to go to Studies, and I'm going to delete the scenario that I already had. We're doing it the hard way in this video. I want to show you every step of what's being done without anything that's streamlining things. I'll right-click Study, Create Scenario, and hit OK. I'll right-click on Model Representation and click Associate Model Rep. I'll select the entire model and hit OK. I'll select Loads and Constraints, double-clicking on that. And I'm going to hit here and there to select all of the loads and constraints. So simply because the forces and constraints were in the model browser doesn't mean that they were actually being entered into the simulation. Sometimes you need to add those manually and you can do that with this loads and constraints menu. We see that the little yellow runner is not ready to go. There's one more thing that we need to do, which is to place this in the analysis scene and make sure that the analysis is ready to go. So I right click on my scenario and click place in analysis scene. I don't have any offenses, so now we're ready to run the simulation. Apex says that the static analysis encountered mechanisms use the results to diagnose the problem. That might be a little bit of a head scratcher. When Apex says mechanisms, it doesn't mean like linkages or cams. It means that something is not fully constrained and it can undergo what we would call rigid body motion as opposed to simply like deflecting like the tip of a beam. That means the finite element model is not going to work right. So we need to figure out what's wrong with our constraints. Um, something is wrong with your constraints or something isn't connected properly is almost always the cause of this error message. Sometimes going into post-processing helps you troubleshoot it. For this particular situation, it's not that informative, so I'll just go fix the problem. We'll go back to the Model tab, and let me select this constraint here. Ah, I forgot to disable rotation about the x-axis. That's what we need to prevent the rotation of the beam as if it were an axle. I'll hit the green check mark to apply, and we would be ready to run the simulation again. I could also add that constraint on the right hand side. It wouldn't make a difference. Um, it just wouldn't be necessary, but it wouldn't cause any problems. Let's try running the simulation again. Now we'll go to post processing. So as usual, we can look at the deformed profile of the beam. And in previous videos, I've shown you how to figure out what the stress is on the beam, what do the cross sections look like, that kind of thing. We could even display the cross sections like that. The next thing I want to show you is how to generate shear and bending moment diagrams. So let's create 2D plots. We can have multiple 2D plots in here. Coming back to the model view, I'll double click on instrumentation. That causes these elements to appear here. And this icon here means that it can be shown in an XY plot. To get the forces, we want to know the Y component forces, because that's what we get for beam shear. So now we have a shear diagram. We have force, really it starts out at zero in a real shear and bending moment diagram, uh, but Apex doesn't calculate all the way out to the very end of the beam, so we see the shear at minus 1000 right away. At the midpoint of the beam where the force is applied, it goes up to 1,000, and then at the right-hand side, it would go back down again to zero. 
We can also look at the bending moment. We normally talk about the bending moment as being like a Z component moment in solid mechanics um, because it's a moment about the Z axis, but it's also a moment for a beam that we're analyzing in the XY plane. So what we want is XY resultant. Now we have the moment diagram here. So at this point, now you know everything you need to know to be able to do the beam modeling totally from scratch. Still, I think that using the beam tool makes it a lot more streamlined. The beam tool also makes it a lot easier to modify the beam, and that's what I'll go over in the next part of this video. Let's exit post-processing. So we can modify the beam using geometry edit tools. We're only going to use a small fraction of what's here. So using vertex edge drag, I can move the vertex that this right-hand side constraint is associated with. I can move it along like over to there. I could move the force out to the end. So now we have kind of a, an overhung support. We can move this constraint back this way and so on. Unfortunately, the vertex edge drag tool doesn't let us move vertices to exact coordinates. Um, but we can get around that by using the point tool. I'll show you exactly how to do that. First, I'm going to move this over here. Let's say we want to move this constraint to be out at one meter. So I'll go to points and select create points by coordinate. Let's say I want to put the point at one meter out and with a Y coordinate of zero and just hit the green apply check mark. And now I have a point right there. If you ever have trouble seeing points, this option here, uh, vertex marker size is very helpful. Now I go back to vertex edge drag and I can drag this vertex and we'll snap to this point. So I couldn't actually drag the vertex to the coordinate that I wanted directly, but I was able to create a point at that coordinate and then drag the vertex there. I'll repeat this process again to get the force out at a coordinate of 1.5 meters. So I'll create a point at 1.5 meters. and hit apply. So the point is right there. And then we'll use vertex edge drag to move the force to that point. All right, great. Okay, so that's how the beam tool works. And some of the advanced geometry edit uh, know-how that can be helpful if you're dealing with a lot of edges and 1D elements in Apex. Um, all right, I want you to check the description for more resources, like how you can get free access to our software, and get in touch if you're interested in teaching with Apex, uh, or teaching with any kind of engineering simulation. All right, have a great day. Bye.